me just take you through the journey of where we think about it from, a, from an FDA perspective. The slide is basically how we started off thinking about not just locally, but also globally, but also thinking about where the things are going in the future. If you, a way to think about digital health, at least from an FDA sort of regulatory and sort of what we are seeing from the space, and you see in different definitions of digital health, the way I think about it is it's a convergence that's happening of people, and I use the word people on purpose and not patients, not consumers, not something else, but it's just people, us as individuals, and information, and information technology and connectivity that's sort of bringing everybody together. This is how I think about it. If I, I took a random article on digital health and I just did a wordle on it and this is what came up, which sort of shows how sort of this is being, being so connected and so ubiquitous throughout our lives. So what does that mean, right? So from a regulatory perspective, you're seeing, not just from a regulatory perspective, just from a humanity and sort of individual perspective, you're seeing that technology in healthcare is becoming truly impactful. It's not only just moving healthcare from the clinic to the patients, uh, and I call it knowing the patient in the wild, but also seeking to understand some new physiology that we, we may be on, on the heels of finding out, of really understanding what's happening. And then finally, but not the least, is like how can digital health focus on prevention? If you think about what does that mean, right? So if you think early detection means uh, the disease state is in a very early stage, which also could mean the therapeutics that you're sort of, you, know, you can sort of engage will be smaller, which means there's many benefits, there's less side effects and so on and so forth. So you can see sort of the excitement and that's why probably you guys are all here. All this is leveraged using computing power and connectivity. And without those things, we would probably not be here today. If you think about this, that's, that is not just happening in, an, in a setting that we knew about in a clinical or an inpatient setting, but it's actually happening across the continuum, across the healthcare continuum, which is expanded. And I, from a business perspective, it's a market share sort of growth, or market size growth, as opposed to where we were always focusing on. So, what does that mean from CDRH perspective? CDRH is the short form for, and, and being from the government, I'm used to acronyms, so I'll, I should have spelled that out. It's Center for Devices and Radiological Health. What we're interested in enabling patient-centered public health that, as digitization touches everybody. We also want to foster trusted, uh, innovative technologies that can truly change the healthcare paradigm. And at, at the last, but not the least, is I'm here and the reason I'm here is my commissioner, my boss, the, the center director, is actually looking at how can we partner with people to get digital future ready and not just the government, but just us as a community. So we're thinking about that and I'm here to sort of seek help from all of you and anybody who's interested in contributing to that. And how do we do this in a collaborative way? Let's look at the current environment. If you think about it, we have so medical device software regulations, we have current changing technology landscape, and, and you have this growing world that digital health sort of brings to the table of real world evidence. What does that mean? It's just not about technology performance, but also evidence that's been created, generated in places that we did not phantom be before, and that's really what we're talking about. The way I sort of peel that layer of onion and think about it from a regulatory perspective, we have been regulating software for a long time and it exists in devices before and it, it continue, will continue to exist. I think about it in these three big buckets, software that's in a medical device that you all know and you know carry about and think about software that's used to make medical devices, so all the manufacturing software. And then the last piece is what is software as a medical device? You think about that for a second. Computer-aided diagnostic software has already, was always been considered medical device. It's always been sort of seen as things that would be a medical device. But there's more and more of that happening in areas that we didn't anticipate or we didn't think about before, and people are being very creative about that. So how do we think about that in a holistic way? This is how we think about it. From a regulatory perspective, we always think about risk-based. So it's not everything. 
When I say risk-based, it's about how do we focus on things that is functionality-based, which means that what does the software do or what does the product does, as opposed to worrying about the platform, which gives us independence from how small the technology can sort of evolve, what the computing location would be, but also promotes technology to be innovate at a time or be available to patients and individuals in, in that we would, we would not be concerned about from, from a regulatory perspective. That gives us that scalability, as you, if you may. And, and then how can we focus narrowly on, on what technologies and on, a, on the risk level basis would be focused from an oversight, FDA oversight perspective. And then let me talk a little bit about what, does, what I mean by oversight. It's not about making sure that you have market access when people are making technology, but also, but it's more about making sure that science behind when you, when you have technologies out there and truly effective. And when those, when those intended purposes or what you intend to do with that technology and functionality, if, if that doesn't work as planned, if it's gonna hurt patients, that's, what we ta that's where the risk-based sort of uh, paradigm comes in. So what does that let us? That gets us, it allows us to promote patient engagement by narrowly focusing and it allows us to protect patient safety, which is our mandate, and promote innovation at the same time. So this is what we've been doing for the last few years. I'll share with you today um, things we have done, tools that are available, the clarity that we have tried to provide through traditional ways of writing guidances, and I'll share with you a little bit of a preview into that. But really, keep this in mind, we are focusing on higher risk and not focusing on lower risk. We believe that at this time, we need to allow technology to blossom, at the same time maintain safety for patients and us as individuals when those things don't work as planned. But that just leaves us only very small areas of things that we need to think about. So. Uh, if you think about the clarity we've been doing since 2013 is we talked about how connectivity sort of happens with wireless. And I'm not going to walk through all of these, but if you, the mobile medical apps was the first guidance in 2013 that we introduced, which sort of laid out this, this policy of what should, be, what should an FDA oversight paradigm mean and look like for mobile medical apps. I'll talk about that in a second, but as you see, the journey has not been do once and be done about it, but also continue to be evolving and be engaged with the community to be aware of where things are going and also being, being clear continuously of where things FDA would be, would be overseeing, where they would not be. So giving, giving you an example, at the very bottom of this triangle, as the world of mobile apps sort of evolved and sort of grew in 2009 onwards, uh, you saw that we saw a requirement that, that we need to tell people which products were not considered medical device. So if you look at this 40-page document, it took us 40 pages, by the way, to sort of explain what that means. And, and, it, and you would think that would be easy, right? But it's not. It's really not that easy because I can articulate a policy at a very high level saying this is where we worry about, this is where we don't worry about, but then we had to supplement that with a bunch of examples, literally about half of the guidance, more than half of the guidance that we, I'm talking about is filled with examples, which is useful for you to show where the thinking is. And then the next layer up is the what is lower risk. This is what I was talking about, about is we are not focusing on this lower risk where we, we think patient engagement is important, where we think patient-centered care is important, and allowing technology to blossom. But we would still focus on those things at the very top of the pyramid that I have here is things that actually do, would create harm for patients if it didn't work as, as intended or as, as planned by the manufacturer. So this is an example I wanted to leave, it with, leave with you guys to sort of take back and sort of see how, this, how that thinking is evolved. What if you can take away from here is how, what does that mean in terms of the FDA's thinking and that would be helpful for you. Thinking about it in a global sense. So we've been working um, on what is software as a medical device from a global perspective. Other regulators around the globe are also struggling with this concept of what does that mean? How should we be thinking about it? What is that looking like? So if you look at this, this man that I've, I've, I have on the slide, it didn't have a, it didn't have a name when, it, when we began this journey. And it became sort of important for us to sort of name that, that man that product, that software as a medical device. So we started with the fundamental and basic thing of what should we call these products it used to be called standalone software, location is not important, so what do we need to call it? We called it software as a medical device. We started defining them, we started bringing a framework where we could 
when you see a product, when you have these characteristics of this product, where would it fit in the risk profile? You may want to take a look at that. And then last year or a couple of years ago, 2015, we talked about what do you guys do as software developers, as, as engineers in your, in your life that will drive quality? And can we, do, can, we do, can we sort of come up with a best practice that we, we can show if you're doing the right engineering you are actually meeting regulatory requirements as well. So that's the flip that we are sort of flipping the argument and flipping the discussion of saying, if you do right things, you actually do meet regulatory requirements across the globe. And this is, this is uh, agreed upon and finalized by about eight countries um, as, um, as of today. So this slide is not just about sort of what, just the email address and the website. It's more about sharing with you what we have evolved over time in sort of saying that we need to provide that connection point for innovators and technologists who can reach out to us. So this email address is where I get emails, my staff get emails, and gets, get answered in a quicker way. It, it, even though it's informal, it get, gives you direction to go. So you may want to use those, that email address. But also we are providing resources, so sort of being more, more creative inside the government trying to figure out how we can actually sort of ser serve the, the innovators in this area. So what does that mean going forward? Here's what I envision. How can we create a regulatory system going forward? So what I've showed you until now is what can we do, what we have done so far. That's all great, but what can we do going forward? When I look at what can we do going forward, as technology sort of evolves at a rapid play, pace, software, as you heard yesterday, if you're not do, using software, you're not creating software, you're not a company anymore, right? So that's what's happening. When you think about that, and think about the development timelines, if you think about the, the development practices, and then think about the globalization of software, that's not only in medic, hardware medical devices, but the software as a medical device becomes so easy, we desire, and this is the vision I have, and this is the vision the agency has, is how can we align a regulatory paradigm that's aligned to development timelines? How do we align the, with the industry practices and real, real world experiences? And I'm talking, I expanded real world evidence, real world experiences on purpose because it is about the experience that patients and you as manufacturers will probably have. And then lastly but not least is how do we align with the global regulators? That's really what we are talking about, and this is an opportunity, and I'm, I'm putting out this call for all of you and anybody who you know was willing to help. This is a fantastic and once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for everybody to sort of work together and prepare us, not just for the agency, but also us as a community in this world. How do you prepare to get digital health future ready? So here are some ideas to, I'm gonna throw out, and you guys are hearing this for the first time. Imagine a TSA pre-check that you, if you flew in to the airport, you get a better experience. You get a better experience instead of getting through the system. You still have to go to the security checkpoint, you still, but you still, don't, you still have to go to the metal detector, but you don't have to take your shoes off, you don't have to take your laptops off, you leave your jackets on. It's creating a different experience. How can I create, how can the agency create a different experience if we had imagined a program called FDA pre-check? I'm going to pause it for a second. And then, it, uh, if you use the concept of the FICO score, which I think we heard yesterday as well, if you take that and say, how can you come up with a score along with a pre-check that creates a better experience, it creates a streamlined process, going back to the objectives I talked about, and then creating a regulatory development kit, you guys may already know are using an SDK for software. How can I create? a regulatory development kit, that people will actually use the regulatory system that provides that confidence that users are demanding. How do we do that? And lastly is how do you bring this evidence together that's been generated in real life that we can sort of use to sort of learn in the regulatory process? So just food for thought. I'm not going to spend a lot of input, um, time on this, and I'm actually out of time. Um, what talent? So you start with this five, basic five questions is what talent we need to leverage, what experience, how do we differentiate that from traditional medical devices to digital health medical devices. Those things are blurring, as you can see. And you can see what part, what, like, what I just asked you guys, what do you imagine this FDA pre-check program to be, and what do you think should be in the RDK that I just talked about? And then, 
how else could we achieve the same patient safety? So what I said, um, the FDA pre-check, the learn, and the, and the RDK are just concepts. How, if you guys are innovators and crea creative folks here can think about other ways, I want to know that, and how do we do that? Thanks. 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 Thanks.